Hello and welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the Wisdom Watchman. Where our mission is to uh, make disciples of all nations and bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to the ends of the earth. Thank you for joining us. Here we work hard and diligently to bring you biblical truth straight out of the pages of Scripture. Um, there is no doctrine. There is no man-made religion here. There is no theology. We don't twist words of Scripture to fit a certain belief system. We don't belong to any Christian organizations or groups or anything like that. This is These are people that absolutely love Jesus Christ. We follow Jesus Christ. We follow the words of the Bible. Plain and simple. We don't bring man-made beliefs into Scripture. We don't use Scripture to form... Uh, to fit inside of any box of man-made beliefs. We take every single word of this precious book as holy and as truth and divinely influenced by God. And that's how we treat it. We treat it with the utmost respect. We don't twist anything. We don't create anything that's not there. And we read the entire thing. And we encourage you, whoever is here, however you were brought here, um, to, to do the same thing, to go digging into the pages of Scripture and compare and read and pray and reflect and read it again and again because there's nothing more precious than the Word of God. It is God's instruction. It is God's love. It's His love letter, letter to His people. And his plan for redemption. For us messing everything up. Through our disobedience and sin. Uh, it's wisdom for us. It's a way to live. It's a way to love. Um, you know, Proverbs 16.16 16, How much better to get wisdom than gold. And to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. That's how we look at these words. So with all that being said, um, the topic of this video is going to be on grace. Now that word, the, the, the scriptures that talk about grace um, can be very controversial because I, think, I don't think a lot of people really understand what grace means. Um, either they don't understand it they don't want to understand it. They're listening to somebody that's lying to them or leading them um, astray. But again, I don't want to bring any man-made teachings or beliefs into this message. So I'm going to go straight to scripture. First, we have to understand what the word grace means. Um, so grace... In today's language, in the in the Webster's Dictionary, um, can mean unmerited favor. It means approval, favor, mercy, pardon, special privilege. But does that really line up to what the biblical writers meant when they used the word grace? What does it mean in the original language? Well, again, the New Testament is written in ancient Greek, and we use the Strong's Concordance to interpret certain words. And grace, um, in that language, is chariz. And chariz is, defi is um, defined as the divine influence on the heart. Again, chariz, which translates to grace is the divine influence on the heart. So what does that mean? Okay, so we're going to go to some scripture to help define what that means and put it into context. Um, so in the Old Covenant, we were uh, people were under the law, the law of God. Under the First Covenant, it was written by 
uh, by God and Moses. So Mo God dictated to Moses what the laws were. And he came down from Mount Sinai over a period of, uh, of a long time to give the, the laws of God to his people. And the Israelites were chosen to stand apart from the rest of the world based on these laws. And this is how they were going to live. Um, and over the years of the Old Covenant, like men usually do, and religion especially, can, tends to twist things. And then they add to it. And they turn it into not at all what it was intended for. And that's Satan's, one of Satan's greatest, um, greatest things that he's done in this world is he takes what God has created and he twists it and he, and he mimics it and mimes it and twists it into something that's not what it was designed for. And he does it to this day with a lot of different things. If you look at today's culture. So before Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, um, they were under the law, the old covenant. Jesus was born. He lived. He preached his message. He brought the kingdom of God to Israel through his ministry. He was killed for blasphemy. That's why the, uh, the religious leaders killed him. He was resurrected three days later through the power of the Holy Spirit and established himself as God. And with that, he established a new covenant with his people. And the new covenant is a covenant under grace. When grace allows us to be forgiven for past sins, to live righteously um, through God's influence and to have eternal life through the precious blood and atonement of Jesus Christ. So we're going to define what grace actually means in scripture. So I'm going to go take you to Titus, the book of Titus towards the end of the new Testament written by Paul, uh, chapter two, verses 11 through 14. And here it goes for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So those four passages describe what grace is, what it does for us, and then the effect of grace, the divine influence on the heart. So let's break this down. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So the grace of God, the divine influence on the heart from God. That leads us to salvation has appeared to all men. How are we led to salvation? Through obeying the commands of Jesus Christ. Through repenting of our sins. What was Jesus' first message when he began his ministry after he was tempted by Satan in the desert for 40 days? He came out and said, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That was his message. So for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So the divine influence on the heart has appeared to every single person ever. Has appeared to all men. And what does it do for us? What does the divine influence on the heart do for us? It teaches us to obey God. Look at verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. So it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. What is ungodliness and worldly lust? Well, it's pretty much every single sin you can think of. 
is ungodliness, living ungodly, and living lustfully, worldly lust, selfishness. Not loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul. Not loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, which is the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave us, on which all the law and the prophets hang. And that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So not only does it teach us what not to do, it teaches us what to do through the divine influence on our heart. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So that means right now. The present age means right now. We need to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And then what happens when we do that? Well, first it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. If we go back up to verse 11, that's what grace of God is that brings salvation. So listen closely to the order, okay? Grace of God that brings us to salvation. So what's the grace of God again? What does it do? Denies ungodliness and worldly lust and also teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So how do we deny ungodliness and worldly lust? We repent. We repent, we forsake, and we cleanse and purify ourselves of all sin by coming clean to God. If you read Psalm 51, Psalm 51 is David's repentance psalm after Nathan the prophet came to him after he um, committed adultery and fornication with a married woman and murdered her husband. This was God's, I'm sorry, this was David's repentance, Psalm 51. I highly encourage you to go through and read that and look, see what repentance actually looks like. Uh, it's a godly sorrow. We talked about that in the last video. It's a brokenness for the sin, not for the result of the sin, but for the sin itself, for disobeying God. So that comes first before salvation. And that grace has appeared to all men. We all have opportunity to do that because we've all sinned. There's only one person ever that was sinless in their life, and that was Jesus Christ. And that's why he had to be the perfect sacrifice for us. So verse 11, verse 12, let's go to 13. <clears throat> what does the grace of God do after it teaches us and then brings us to salvation? Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if we're saved, we're going to be looking forward to his return, looking forward to seeing him. He's the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, for those that are living in disobedience and sin, it's not going to be a glorious appearing. It's going to be scary. It's going to be full of fear and condemnation and judgment. And how did he do this for us? How did he give us forgiveness? Because he gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. He's setting us apart so we can become zealous for good works, to preach the gospel, to be an example, to live like Jesus Christ, to expand his kingdom through our lives, living and abiding in Jesus Christ. So that is grace, the divine influence on the heart. And these four passages talk beautifully about what it actually is, what it does, what it is, what it does, and the result of grace. I truly hope that makes sense. I hope I explained that correctly so you can understand it. Um, the next passage we're going to go to 
is in uh, Ephesians. Again, it's written by Paul. Paul wrote about grace a lot because uh, he was um, commissioned by Jesus Christ to go and preach to the Gentiles. We're going to go to Ephesians 2. And I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to go all the way to verse 10. There's a couple of passages in here that are always pulled out of context. Um, I spoke about this in the last video. Uh, it's called proof texting. It's called taking a very small snippet of scripture and twisting it and turning it into something it's not by taking it out of context. I'll continue to say this. If I have to read an entire chapter to get the point across so you can understand what the verses are actually saying and what it means, then I'll do that. So there's a couple in here that are always taken out and letting people and, and giving people the impression that salvation is easy, that salvation is, um, you know, that we can just respond to an altar call, say a prayer and we're saved that there's nothing, there's no repentance. I have to go into it. There's nothing that has to go into it. Uh, when, we just shown in Titus uh, that it has everything to do with it, that there are things that we have to do to come to Jesus to receive the salvation. We have to repent. We have to um, forsake the sin. We have to come clean to God. We have to purify and purge that evil uh darkness that's in our hearts through repentance through a godly sorrow and once that's gone we come to jesus and then then we're forgiven of our sin and it doesn't happen before we do that because if we do not repent that sin still lives inside of us is still in our hearts so even if we come to jesus we can't be forgiven because that sin is still there it's still in our hearts. It's still affecting us. It's still infecting our bodies, our minds, our thoughts, our words. That sin has to be destroyed first through repentance. Come to God with a clean heart through repentance. And then we're saved and covered in his blood and born again. We have to die to that sin. And again, I'll put all the scriptures on the screen. Um, just, ch just book, chapter, and verse. So you can write these down. There's a lot. I suggest that you go and study these uh, on your own. Talking about how we are supposed to die. Literally, we're supposed to die. So we can be raised back to life through the Holy Spirit. Be born again. How do we die? Not literally die not physically but we die we crucify ourselves through repentance what well, was Jesus's first message repent and believe the gospel repent and believe the gospel sorry I went off on a little tangent there we're gonna go back to Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10 And you, he made alive. So he's talking to believers. He's talking to followers of the way, Jesus Christ. And you were made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. I'm going to stop there real quick. So we are now made alive because we were previously dead from our sins. We once, we past tense, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, for those of you that don't know, that is another name for Satan. Uh, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? Very simply, the ones that disobey God, the ones that do not follow his commands, the ones that continue to sin, continue to willfully sin and reject God, reject his grace, the divine influence on the heart. 
You can reject that, do your own thing, and that's sin, and then you are now in disobedience of God. So, a lot of people will say that we're say once saved, always saved, recovered under grace. It doesn't matter if we continue to sin because we're under grace. Well, listen to this passage again. We, um, in which we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So the sons of disobedience are in, are being inspired and controlled by Satan. Do you really think that the saints and the followers of Jesus Christ that are covered in his blood will be controlled by Satan and that they'll still be allowed in the kingdom? Sit on that for a little while. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So I'm going to stop there again. Everything is in past tense. We want, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. We were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Um, a lot of the false teachers and the people that are lying will pin this on current followers, current believers. Verse four, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So while we were continuing to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, we are willfully openly disobeying God among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. I was here for a very long time. I, I willingly did these things against God's word. And I used to profess the name of Jesus Christ while I was doing this. Verse four, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. He still loved me while I was doing all these things. I knew I was doing wrong. That was his grace, but I continued to choose to do the wrong thing. But his grace was still working in me, still convicting me. Oh, I didn't listen. I rejected it. But despite all that, he still loved me. Verse five, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. Verse six, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So verse five, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. That's the quickening that grace provides for us. The quickening is the work of grace, the divine influence on the heart. When we were once dead in our trespasses and through repentance, through the clearing, through coming clean to God, through um, actual brokenness and godly sorrow through, uh, which brings us, brings me to, um, purifying and purging of the darkness out of the heart, literally dying to sin and then made alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved and raised up and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse seven, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So this is a continuing thing. We are then born, reborn with the Holy Spirit, but his grace still abounds in our life. We still have that divine influence on the heart. Verse eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So for by grace we have been saved through faith. What is faith again? Faith means to rely with inward, most inward most certainty, obey, fully trust, fully yield to the authority of Christ. And that's not of ourselves, which means it's, that is the grace that enables us to do that. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's the grace that enables us to do that, but we have to choose to walk it out, to let the grace work through us. We can choose to deny it and continue to sin and do our own thing. But that is the gift of God, that influence. When it says not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, this is a this this is the part that a lot of people take out of context, not of works. What does that mean? Well, in the old covenant, like we discussed earlier, there was works involved with that covenant. They there was circumcision to prove that they were under that covenant. There was external washings that they had to do routinely for repentance. Um, they had to do sacrifices for the sins, for the un, uh, unwilling sin or the unknowing sin of the village. They would do sacrifices every single year. There was religious um, ceremonies involved in the, under the old covenant that they had to do. Those are the works that they're talking about. These works are not, I repeat, not talking about repentance, actual repentance, coming clean before God. Experiencing that godly sorrow, purging and purifying our hearts of the sin and the darkness that live there, and crucifying ourselves and dying to sin. Those are not the works that this is talking about. These are talking about the external works. What's needed for salvation, which is brought on by the grace of God, are the internal works in our heart. Paul talks later on in, um, in, in his letters that our heart is now circumcised for God. Our heart, not literally, figuratively, spiritually. That's what that repentance does. That's what the grace enables us to do, which leads us to salvation. Teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. To live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. That's what grace does. For we are, in verse 10 on Ephesians, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We're born again in Christ Jesus. We've been made new in Christ Jesus. Our heart is pure. Turned to flesh in Christ Jesus. The laws are written on our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus by his grace. And we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you get in the context of, of grace and what that actually is and what it means and what it does for us. Um, we're going to go to another passage in 2 Corinthians 6, again written by Paul. Uh, verse 1, we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, that passage is important because it precedes chapter 5 um, that talks about what Jesus did. How he sacrificed himself for our sins so we can be forgiven through his blood. And then it starts off chapter 6, we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, chapter uh, verse 2, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Now, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 
we give no offense in anything that our ministry may be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes and imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastening and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing every th all things. That is the grace of God. That is the divine influence on the heart. That is the new covenant. Grace is not a magic covering for sin. Grace is not an exemption for our willing dis willingly disobeying God. Grace is not a pardon so we can continue to live for this life and expect to be blessed in the next. I don't care what anybody says in the church. These scriptures are very clear. They're clear. Read them from start to finish, beginning to end. I don't know how anybody can read through all of this that we just went over. These are just a couple passages. The entire New Testament says this. I don't know how anybody can twist these and, and really believe it. And people believe this. Believe that we can continue to just willingly turn our face away from God and sin and, and do these vile things and pornography and adultery and drunkenness and, and, and all of that stuff and think that we're still going to heaven, that we're still going to be saved and have eternal life. I, I don't understand it. Okay, so the next place we're going to go is in Hebrews 10. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read until we stop. <laughs> uh, this goes into um, some, of the, the, some of the works and the laws of the Old Covenant and how it transitions into the New Covenant as far as sacrifice, um, what Jesus did as a sacrifice, and what happens if we continue to sin after knowing the truth of that sacrifice, after accepting that. Uh, this is pretty clear that the, uh, the magic covering of grace is not going to keep us saved. Um, so I'm going to read this and we'll stop and, and explain as we go. I'll do my best to keep it short. No promises. So here we go. Verse, uh, verse one in Hebrews 10 for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So the way it worked in the Old Covenant is any sin, any unwilling sin, um, the village would all bring it to the high priest of the village. And they would, they would sacrifice um, the goat or the bull, whatever it is, and uh, that would atone for the sins of the village. Um, and that would be good for about a year. But they would have to do this every single year. Now, this was a foreshadow of what Jesus was about to do on the cross for us to atone for sins, all of our past sins. Um, but the blood and goats, the blood of goats and the blood of bulls isn't going to keep us sanctified. Okay. Uh, verse two, for then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified 
would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, so whenever it says therefore, it means take what, we ju- what I just wrote and listen to what I'm about to write because it all ties together. Therefore, then he came into the world. Who's he? Jesus Christ. And he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings of sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Now, verse 9, they're talking about the take away the the old covenant, the old covenant of the blood of bulls and goats, and establish the new covenant of the blood of Christ to atone for sins once and for all. Verse 10, by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So this is why Jesus had to be sinless because he's the high priest. He's the perfect priest. The priest had to be sanctified first before he can perform perform the um, sacrifices of the of the bulls and goats for the town. That's why Jesus had to be had to be perfect. That's why he was perfect. He's the only one that ever was. Does that make sense? I hope so. Verse twelve. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. So let's go back to 12 real quick. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, offered one sacrifice for sins forever. This just means that his sacrifice is good for anybody that comes to him under his terms, after repentance, that their sins are then washed clean from his blood for, uh, and purified. And, and he's now, they are now sanctified by his blood. This does not mean future sins. Let's get that perfectly clear. This does not mean sins. I'm going to, uh, that if I were to sin next week, this is, this is not going to cover those sins. And as we get deeper into this chapter, it'll show that. Don't take my word for it. Let's go back to the word. Verse 14, for by one offering, he had perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. So verse 15 The Holy Spirit is now, after we're born again, becomes a witness to us. And the new covenant, like I said, establishes the the laws written on our hearts and on our minds, which is a witness from the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Past sins. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Let's stop here. Let's plant right here for a second. There are some people that say once saved, always saved. All you have to do is come to Jesus. You're covered by grace. You're good. Doesn't matter what you do. You're going to heaven. Okay. Verse 18. 
Now, where there is remission of these, what's remission? It's to go back to, it's coming back. Where there's remission of these, but go. let's go back to the verse before. The, law, uh, uh, the law is written on our hearts and minds, which then allows God to remember no more their lawless deeds, their sins and lawless deeds. But if we remiss... If there's remission in these, if we go back to those sins, those lawless deeds and sins, there is no longer an offering for sin, which means Jesus' sacrifice does not cover any sins after we've been sanctified. Verse 19, therefore, there's that word again, therefore, which means... After I just said it's these all all these things, now tie that into what I'm about to tell you. Therefore, brethren, brethren, he's talking to believers. He's a brother. These are people that follow Christ. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, this is a reference to repentance, purging and purifying of the heart. Provided by the divine influence on our heart, which is grace. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much as more as you see the day approaching, Now, if you didn't hear anything I said before, I want you to hear this in verse 26 through 29. This is for all those people that still believe once saved, always saved. And grace is a covering for sin. Listen up. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So I'm going to stop there for one second. So if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's in verse 26. Let's go back to verse 18, where it says, Now where there, where there is remission of these, talking about lawless deeds and sin, there is no longer an offering for sin. So he says this twice. 27, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. What are adversaries? People that are disobeying God, the sons of disobedience, the children of wrath. Certain, certain. When God says it's certain, it means it is absolutely certain. Fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. I don't want to be there. Verse 28, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So these are the people that reject the law. And there's two or three witnesses that came forth and said, yes, this person committed adultery. Yes, this person is, uh, is a blasphemer. Yes, this person sinned against God. He is now condemned. And if it's a sin unto death, a willful sin, they are dead. They die by the, by the letter of the law in the old covenant. So that's what he's saying here. Now in verse 29, listen carefully. Talking about the new covenant now. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant, the new covenant, by which he was sanctified a common thing 
and insulted the spirit of grace. I don't understand how anybody can read that and still think once they're saved and sanctified and they continue to defile God, that they're con they still saved. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? So when we willfully sin after we've been sanctified and gone through the process of repentance and then we go back to our old life, it says we're going to be trampled. We are trampling the Son of God underfoot. We're trampling Jesus under our feet. And counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. Which means it's common. His blood meant nothing to us. And insulted the spirit of grace. God's free gift. God's divine influence on the heart. Which leads us to salvation. God's free gift that teaches us. To deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We insult that spirit by trampling the Son of God underfoot if we continue to willfully sin. So I've said a couple of times sins unto death and, un and unknowing sin. So um, Paul talks in a couple different places about uh, the sins unto death. I'm going to briefly touch on these just so there's no confusion. Um, so I'm going to start in verse, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians verse 6 through 11. And again, I'll start in 8 because he's talking to believers here. He's talking to followers of Christ. Whenever uh, Paul says brethren, he's talking to his brothers. Who are our brothers? What did Jesus say who his brothers and his mother and his sister is? It's the, it's the ones who do the will of God. So verse 8. 1 Corinthians 6. No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know? That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were sanctified, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So these are considered sins unto death. And a lot of us are guilty of some of these things on these li on this list. But then it follows it in verse 11. And such were some of you. So was I. So were you. But. I was washed. I was sanctified. I was justified. In the name of Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God. Back to Ephesians in chapter 5. More, uh, more talking about the sins unto death. And we're going to start in verse 1. Again, talking to believers. All of his letters are talking to the church. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet swelling, sweet smelling aroma. 
but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. So if you're saints, these things, they don't belong to you anymore. They, that's not you anymore. You are dead to that. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coerce jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So if you do these things, you you're, you're, you will not partake in everlasting life. You will not reign and rule with Christ in heaven. You will not have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Verse 6. Now, there, this is a common theme in, the, in uh, Galatians, which we just read. Or, I'm sorry, in uh, 1 Corinthians. And now in Ephesians, after he lists these, these sins, says the same thing. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. Let no one deceive you with empty words. And in, in other words, don't let anyone deceive you saying that you're covered by grace. Don't let anyone deceive you that you can continue to sin and disobey and still inherit the kingdom. For because of these things, these things before, he's just said, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Again, that, that term, sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, the... Um, the last verses I'm going to touch in is again talking about sins unto death. And then the fruits of the Spirit. We're going to finish on a good note this time. Uh, Galatians 5 verses 19 through 25. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you do these things, you are not going to heaven. You are trampling the Son of God underfoot. You are insulting the Spirit of grace. And you are denying the sacrifice. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin if you do these things. But, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or patience, depending on your translation, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I hope you learned a little bit about grace, what it actually means. Um, it's not a magic covering for sin. It's not a get out of jail free card if you choose to sin. It is the divine influence on the heart which leads us to repentance. Which brings us to salvation. And that's not something to be taken lightly. Just like the uh, the Israelites when he established the, the the old covenant, they were called to be set apart, to be different from the rest of the world. 
Now Jesus came because the old covenant was it, it didn't work. It wasn't the long-term plan. It was the short-term fix, but it wasn't the long-term plan for God's people. Jesus Christ was the plan all along for God. And when Jesus came, he established the new covenant. He made a way for us to be forgiven of sin once and for all. That his sacrifice is the perfect and holy sacrifice to cover our sin. To bring us back to God. Establish that new covenant. But we, we accepted the terms of that covenant that Jesus laid out for us. We are then again called to be set apart from the rest of the world. Now if we break that new covenant, we are not inheriting the kingdom of God. We will be thrown into outer darkness and judged like the rest of the world. Don't let anybody deceive you, brothers and sisters. Don't let anybody deceive you. Jesus Christ loves us so much. The greatest love is to lay down your life, willingly lay down your life for your brother. And Jesus did that. He did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for every single person we know. Let's not trample the Son of God underfoot. Let's not insult the Spirit of grace. Let's not receive the gift of grace in vain. What's marriage? Marriage is a covenant between a man and and a woman. It's a promise to live together in holy matrimony, to live as one flesh through sickness and in health, for richer or poorer, poorer, better or for worse. Now, if one of us were to sin against the other, it's breaking that covenant. If I were to commit adultery against my wife, she would leave. And that covenant would be broken. What makes you think that if we sin against God, we've walked into this new covenant with him? What makes you think that if we continue to sin, that he will not break that covenant with us? Or he will not leave, leave us in the outer darkness? God's mercy has brought us to the point where our past sins and our old life will be forgiven. And there is many in mine. But with that in mind, why would I continue and do that in the future? Knowing the sacrifice He made for me. Do not be deceived, brothers and sisters. Again, I implore you to Look through the pages of scriptures yourself. Um, do this study on your own. Compare one letter of Paul to another letter. The Word of God will never contradict itself. Uh, it's a very powerful thing. And I hope that you learn something. Um, again, uh, like and share and comment. And subscribe to the page. There's going to be more videos coming out about a lot of different topics. I hope you enjoyed this. And I did keep it under an hour. So, awesome. Once again, I thank you for joining me. Um, live the good, Fight the good fight of faith. Continue to strive to get to the narrow gate. And the goal is for the Lord to... Welcome up, welcome us into his arms and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I thank you for joining me. I love you all and all glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.